Welcome to the 33rd annual VBSR conference. Today we are here at Dialed Studio running some interviews with leaders in our community on the question of how to achieve a healthy economic system by meeting the basic human needs of all people. Today we have Michael Monty, who is the Executive Director of Champlain Housing Trust, and my good friend. It's so Hi, good Lauren, to Glenn. see good you. Good to see you, too. So, Michael, you are a busy man. Mm -hmm. You are dealing with so many of the housing issues that are pressing in our community. Housing is a top concern for people mm -hmm. all across the county, across the state. Can you tell us why it's important for people at all levels of the economic order to have access for housing and how that benefits the general economic well-being of everyone? Sure. Um, I mean, we'll just look over the last few years during COVID where the prescription that was handed down by CDC and others is that you need to, you needed to be isolated. You needed to be housed. Housing suddenly became a prescription for success, to be safe. Housing was healthcare at that moment. And that's why the state has responded in such a dramatic way over the last few years and continues to try to work through making sure people are housed. But it's also just an essential part of the economic system. Nobody's going to be wealthy. Nobody's going to be successful. Nobody's going to be able to take care of their children. Nobody's going to be able to do the things that they need to do unless they are housed. It's really a bottom line. You know, if we wanted to say the healthcare system is essential, a housing system is essential. And right now we have a framework which is sort of just everybody's doing whatever they can. And there are some things that can be done to break open the opportunities for more housing. But we essentially need more housing of every kind. We definitely need more affordable housing. We definitely need programs that support the people who are most in need of being successful in their housing. And we need middle income housing. We need housing of all types. So, you know, without that, employers can't hire people. Employees can't be successful in terms of their own getting to work on time and uh, doing all those things. You can't have self-care in your home. I was at the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont meeting yesterday and they want to be able to do more home care. There's no home care if you don't have a house. So these things are just, it's just a framework. It has to be, if, if roads are essential, housing is essential. It's really a basic need and needs, and needs to be thought of in those terms. People talk about housing access as a crisis. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what has, has that always been the case or what has changed since the 1980s? Well, I think it's been, I think there's always been an issue around how to achieve affordability. And I think at t times, historically, classes of people like white folks have been able to sort of be able to get access to home ownership. And black people, black folks, people of color have not have access. We can sort of see the difference in those communities as a result, right? Um, so I don't know if it's changed a, a lot. Um, I would say over the last few years, it became more dramatic with a certain level of health care issues going uh, on relative to addiction and other things. So there's a class of people now who are struggling. And they're struggling not just because of housing, but because of other things, right? It's a small group. It's not like everyone. Um, but I would, I would say that it, it shifts and it changes. The need is still for basic affordability. The need is still for people to pay only a percentage of their income. There has been a shift in terms of income distribution. You know, we could sort of see things up till 1980 being where, you know, people who are at the top of the pyramid are making the same percentage of increases as the people who are working class. That shifted dramatically. So now there's a, there's a larger number of folks who are lower income, a larger number of people who can't achieve affordability. We haven't built as much housing as we needed to over the last few decades. Three or four different factors, you know, supply, income have all contributed to a greater level of crisis we, that we face here in Vermont, but it's well, all over the United States. To be clear, we're not special or different necessarily. In some places where communities aren't as, um, as vital, perhaps not have as much investment, they face other issues around housing, which are still critical, but they're different than Vermont in particular, which suffers from a lack of supply and a lack of you know, opportunity. And what is CHT Champlain Housing Trust doing? What's the role that you're playing? Well, we're just, it's, it's a little like we're constantly at it. Um, so, you know, we do counseling and education for people who are just learning how to be successful financially. We do lending of different 
of different types for farm worker housing for people who want to uh, who, who homeowners who are low income uh, we do shared equity home ownership permanent affordability getting people into homes which are less expensive than the rental market right now and they could enjoy all the benefits of home ownership including some wealth building uh, we have a special program called the home ownership equity program which does supports people who are people of color who want to get to be who want to be first-time home buyers who have traditionally been left out of the system we have a ton of rental housing of different kinds all over uh, the northwest vermont and then we do special kinds of programs and services specifically for folks who are homeless either rental housing of different types or you know the the elma avenue community the pod community and Harbor Place and a few other things where homelessness, you know, is, a, is the first step to becoming successful as a renter, to becoming successful as a homeowner. And so we do really a continuum of housing and of different types. Michael, I want to thank you so much for joining sure. us here at the BBS. Thanks for the conference. opportunity. Always a joy to see you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate yes. it. Carrie Staler is the public affairs officer, government and public affairs officer at the Vermont Food Bank. Carrie, welcome. So nice to see you. Thanks. It's so nice to be here. You were just on a policy committee, um, a policy workshop. Was that right? Yes, I was just in the policy workshop that was led by Kristen from VBSR and it had our federal delegation staff there. So it was a really, um, it was a really exciting room to be in. Lots of great ideas flying. Well, the, the subject of these interviews is a healthy economic system and how meeting the basic human needs of all people contributes to everyone's well-being. You work in the, the food security business, but I imagine when I ask you this question, how do we achieve a healthy economic system in food security, um, for food security, that maybe it has a bigger answer than just food? Yeah, I will say that we have an interesting vantage point at the food bank. The charitable food ne network was set up to serve two purposes initially, like way back it was set up to serve the needs of grocery stores that had excess food in addition to serving the needs of people who didn't have enough food. So there has always been this twofold mission, but we have, you know, much more recently spent a lot of time looking at why there are so many people who need to use the charitable food system. And recently during the pandemic really got to watch the system shift and change to meet people's needs in a way that we hadn't seen um, essentially in the history of the food bank in Vermont, which is about 35 years. So during the pandemic, there were amazing programs that were put in place that truly solved the problem. There was a child tax credit. There were stimulus checks. There were, you know, rent rebate programs. There were housing support programs put in place. And so many of the organizations that we work with saw a precipitous drop off and people using their charitable food services at food shelves and food pantries and, you know, even some of our direct distributions and all of those other indirect programs that were meeting people's financial needs, their physical needs, their health needs. You know, Medicaid expansion happened a lot during the pandemic in many, many states, including Vermont. All of those other programs lessened a dependency on charitable and free food. And so for us, we are able to look at the past three years and say, this is a solvable problem. We know how to meet people's needs. It's not a question of which policies necessarily or how to roll them out or who really needs them and is going to use them. It's a question of finding the will and essentially the tax revenue to create and sustain those programs, either at the federal level or at the state level or at both. And so I think when we're talking about that and thinking about how to fund those programs and whether and who's responsible for funding those programs, right? Those are the real questions that we need to be talking about, not, you know, as an economy, how can people do a better job taking care of themselves? There's this real focus on individualism and the classic pull yourself up by the bootstrap situation, which, you know, is a nice myth and, a, and an interesting tale, but is not nearly as effective as public policy that impacts broad ranges of people and people's experiences. And how does the food bank work with those other organizations to solve the systemic 
question that you're posing? Yeah, I think that's something we're really looking deeply into right now. Um, traditionally, we have been a food distribution organization, um, and we all know and recognize that more food is not going to solve food security. It'll temporarily help the people who need that support, and we're going to continue to do that work. But we're doing some innovative work to try and understand what else we can do that would help that. Part of my role is to work in coalition with nonprofit and for-profit partners on policy changes like paid family and medical leave, like child care, like universal school meals, programs that will be publicly funded and broadly supported that will address the needs that help people stay employed, that help people get work, that help people go in and out of you know, their jobs in a supported way so that they don't have to fall out of the workforce and can continue to bring in income for their families. Um, in addition to that, we have what's what we're calling our Food Security Innovation Lab, and they're doing these four really interesting projects, and I'm going to do my best to name them all accurately. There is um, a project where we are looking at actual food delivery, so we're looking at how um, older adults receive food. There's a federal program called the Commodity Supplemental Food Program that serves people over 60 who make 130% of the federal poverty level or less. And if you're wondering what that number is, it's not a lot. So it's this very limited program that provides shelf-stable food for people. One of the biggest requests in that program is like, I want more fresh food. I want food that works for my special diet that my doctor put me on because I have heart disease or I have diabetes or I have these other health issues. So we're doing a pilot project in the Rutland area to deliver fresh food to people that they get to order and choose and then is delivered to their home and really taking notes on how that works for people and, you know, what they do order and what they don't order and why and how that delivery system um, works and what's needed to continue and support that. Because as a rural state, a lot of our older adults do not have the transportation options they need to get to the food that they need. Um, another one of the pilot projects, I might have to like look them up. Um, <laughs> but we can just, there are pilot projects. There are four pilot projects, and they're really looking at some of those root causes. So transportation, there's one that's based on the idea of guaranteed basic income. Um, there is a system looking at how to connect um, social services options through a one-door style pilot where we're working with a health center in Lamoille County. So the people who need support through that health center system are also able to get access to all of the other available programmatic benefits that are available to the state um, so that they're matched with things that help support their health and their well-being. Um, and then there's a fourth one that I can't remember. But that's, a, I mean, <laughs> it's an innovative lab, innovation lab and these are the kinds of systemic solutions that come out of collaboration with entities that aren't just concerned with food Yes, security. and I think the big answer to that, that is that we have to collaborate. There's no way, and the food bank fully recognizes, it's like there's no way we can make these solutions, but we can be part of these solutions and we can help convene these conversations and we can help bring partners to the table or we can help elevate these issues so that people who may not have made the connection between housing and food security really understand that how, how interlinked those problems are. Carrie Staler, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very energized by what you're saying and congratulations on the on the progress. I know, you know, the the end of the pandemic kind of sets us back in some of these solutions being funded by the government, but I know that we now have a good understanding of how to address food security in a way that we didn't before. And I appreciate that you came to speak with us today. I'm so glad to be here to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. Megan Humphrey, I'm so glad to welcome you here to Dialed Studio at the 33rd Annual VBSR Conference. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Megan is the Executive Director of HANDS, which is a wonderful acronym for helping and nurturing diverse seniors. Now tell us why and how working with diverse seniors in our community benefits everyone in the economic system. Okay, we primarily serve, um, okay, I'm gonna start over, because we, we serve seniors who are low income. And so if we can help out a little bit with food and getting them food, that helps everybody in a society. It helps the seniors stay healthier longer, 
and it helps all of the other systems that need to be put in place. So healthcare, their dependence or non-dependence on other family members, which can therefore affect the ability of those folks to be able to go to work every day. So it, as it's been really shown and magnified during the pandemic, each of those is interrelated and we really need to work on that at all of these levels. Tell us some of the activities and programs that HANDS operates. Um, During the pandemic, we did a program called Support Buddies, and we connected volunteers with seniors who needed everything from from a phone call to groceries. And that program has been winding down because of funding issues. Um, And right now we're gearing up a fairly new program. This is our second year, and it's called Diverse Pantry. And we are trying to get culturally appropriate food to people in different communities so the immigrant and BIPOC communities especially so that's going to be really fun we partnered with some African farmers last year and we'll be expanding that Um, and they're growing food in some cases that I've never heard of but we've got some other folks helping out with that and we'll be partnering with especially feeding Chittenden to get some of the food delivered to these folks so that's going to be a great new program one of the great things about food is that it connects people and I think you are aware, but the U.S. Surgeon General just came out with a report and recommendations to address the loneliness crisis. Right. How does HANDS interact with people on that level? I think that loneliness, I think each of us can take ourselves as an example. If you're home alone for dinner, you might eat a bowl of cereal or open a can of tuna fish or something like that. Um, Whereas if you're gathering with people, it's certainly more enjoyable. You're sharing food. There's a commonality about food, um, whether it's in your family or a family that may be Vietnamese. There is um, the gathering over food that's so important. And it does help our well-being in other ways than our body as well. It does really, really diminish loneliness, and that's hugely important. And how has Hans worked in that realm how how do you see you know i know i think back to the christmas festivities mm-hmm. and it isn't just having a christmas meal but you wrap beautiful presents for people mm-hmm. you, i mean you've really thought about aspects that nourish the whole person yes and i think i think it's about connection and connecting each other and so many of these seniors live alone So that makes it really tough. So it's nice to just have somebody show up at the door or invite them to a place to gather. It it makes a huge difference. And during the time you've done this work, are you you hopeful that we are taking a more caring and careful approach with seniors? Are you hopeful for our community? I'm hopeful. I think we I think we learned some lessons or relearned them during the pandemic. I I know I keep bringing that up, but I think it was such an interesting time to look at the whole planet full of people and how we interact and making sure that people have really basic necessities like a place to live, food enough to eat. So I think that that hopefully we we can take some of those lessons forward that we're not just going to go back to the way things were um, because it wasn't equal and we need to really work toward that. Megan Humphrey of Hands, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We're here with Teresa Snow, who is the executive director of Salvation Farms at the 33rd annual VBSR conference and we're at Dialed Studios. I keep wanting to say Dialed In Studios, but we're at Dialed Studios, which is a beautiful space here in Hula in Burlington. And we're having a great time. Teresa, welcome. All right, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I've been to several of these and they're always inspiring. What's what's nourishing for you about the VBSR conference and family? Um, that it's a community of people that don't necessarily know each other, although you do know some folks, um, but that care about doing business in a way that has positive impact in the world. Yeah. Well, Salvation Farms has been going strong for the last two decades. You are the founder, and I know that you are very proud of the work that you've done, but also I think you see systemically 
the place Salvation Farms has in the bigger work of economic security for all people. Mm -hmm. And the question really is, how does meeting the basic needs of some people contribute Mm -hmm. to the economic well-being of all people? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can shed some light on that question. Yeah, well... uh as a founder of an organization, I'm cautious sometimes that my opinion sometimes bleeds into the organization's voice and vice versa. But personally, what I believe um, is that you know, meeting basic human needs, whatever that is, for the individual that um, doesn't quite have all of their needs met, um, contributes to an overall wellness. And when I think about... Um, you know, wellness at the community level, everyone needs to have security, whatever that security is for the individual. You know, whether that is food, whether it's transportation, whether it's housing or childcare, um, employment, it's, it, it contributes to an individual wellness, which leads to a collective wellness. And I think because of the inequities we have um, in Vermont and across this country and the globe, um, it leads to um, unwellness in our communities, um, which, you know, I think. Hmm. How does that show up for you when you say unwellness in the communities? Hmm. So ca- I'm so cautious with my words because um, I don't want to. Um, have it appear as judgment. Sure. I think circumstances force people to make hard choices. And those hard choices aren't always uh, what are thought of as um, morally right. And um, sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures and they aren't always what is socially acceptable um, at the time. So I think that um, unwellness is when people just don't have security they're bound to make choices that uh, aren't good for themselves aren't good for their families or in their greater community and I think that ripples out and what role does Salvation Farms play in working with Vermonters to achieve these levels of security necessary for our collective well-being. Yeah. So Salvation Farms um, is a food system organization, and we look at building more resilience and security within the food system by using um, available but unused food items that are grown close to where it's consumed um, or should be could be consumed Um, so for us uh, we look at a symptom level approach and impact while also having short-term symptomatic impact Um, so we collect surplus uh, food items mostly produce uh, and distribute that locally to individuals who um, rely on others for um, to meet their nutritional needs so food shelves and senior meal sites and um, preschools etc after school programs uh, affordable housing and What we're inspired to do is not just move this food in a short-term way, but engage people in the process so that they become more familiar with what is locally available, seasonally acclimated, um, so that we're building an educated eater base while also helping rebuild a short food supply chain that can actually handle more of the food that is produced locally. We have a challenging time moving food locally, and we don't have a lot of processing locally. We don't we have barriers to moving food into institutions. So um, what Salvation Farms is looking at is really how can we um, reduce the import of something as essential as food um, to reduce population vulnerability by helping build a more local food supply chain with food that currently isn't being used. Um, So we're taking this approach of both supply chain, short-term needs, um, as well as research, resource management. So, And how do you work in collaboration with other organizations that are trying to address symptoms of the same issue? Is that a key part of your systemic approach? It's a good question. Um, you know, as a nonprofit resource, financial resources always limit the potential, but, um, and 
alignment with other organizations um, is incredibly important and particularly for us when thinking about leveraging assets um, there's a lot that um, e other entities can do to help meet each other's missions and advance them so for us we don't just look at moving food we also look at let's say workforce development uh, but workforce development um, is reliant on transportation um, and then also things like uh, the the benefits cliff well if we are bringing people into a workforce development initiative but the compensation they receive receives makes them lose their other benefits which means their family is in jeopardy of meeting some of their other needs um, these are really important conversations to not be having an isolation that's that's again the, cause, well some of the issue with focusing just on symptoms it just perpetuates the problem versus getting diverse people at the table looking collectively at kind of that community wellness that if if we want to help people get increased employment so that they can have child care um, we need to figure out the transportation and you know then address you know, access to food it means all part of the, the puzzle. And I think the challenge for us to actually engage, whether it's our organization or another, is that we phil philanthropy reinforces this very short term thinking and investment. So you can't have those collective community wide impact conversations. Um, but we try. And I think we were, you know, we work with a lot of different organizations from um, government agencies to to for-profit businesses to a lot of nonprofits uh, we can't do our work alone and we don't claim to you know we rely on these partners uh, to make our impact real I imagine that's one of the benefits of being here at the VBSR conference because you can talk to people and start to develop relationships with people you've never met and organizations that could help. Yeah, yeah and one thing I, I love at these events is that, um, again, that connecting of resources and assets, it's not always about advancing what I'm doing or my organization, but it's he learning about someone else's work and saying, oh, you know who you should talk to? Mm -hmm. Because I think that what you're doing really aligns with some of their interests. And again, it's that like ability to advance priorities together, um, even if the, the connection isn't immediately clear. Well, I think, Teresa, that you understand that in order for Salvation Farms to be successful, it needs to be part of a systemic response. And that's the hallmark of a wise leader. So mm. thank you for seeing that and thank you for your work and thanks for joining us here today yeah. at the conference. That's a very kind compliment. Thank you and thank you for having me. We return to the 33rd annual VBSR conference. We're in partnership with Dialed Studio, running a series of interviews with leaders from across the nonprofit and public benefit system. And we are here today with Jake Ide, who is the Director of Investment and Philanthropy for the Vermont Community Loan Fund. Jake, welcome. Thank you, Lauren Glenn. It's lovely to be here with you. We were just saying it's been actually a long time since we've all been together mm. in a space like this. What's it feel like? It feels incredible. Uh, I mean, I was telling you before we went on the air that I was actually, this was going to be the first conference that I was going to do post-COVID coming back to... Um, sing the Vermont Community Loan Fund song at a conference for the first time, and I got COVID right before this conference last year, and so I missed it. It was it was really actually very disappointing, devastating. I was really excited about it, both for the subject matter and because I feel so passionately about VBSR and VBSR's mission. Um, but yeah, like you said, just because what I'm really missing is being together, being with people, seeing people's whole faces, not just half the face, and um, you know, just, I, we we all know we lost so much of that connection and felt so much lesser maybe during COVID than we feel when we're able to be out doing this and be out with everyone in an incredible space and seeing all the incredible work that everyone else is doing in the VBSR community. It's really wonderful to experience it in person as opposed to looking at it in a box on a screen or reading about it and saying like oh that'll be great i'll get there someday i'll be able to go there someday and see that business you know well you must look at a, well you you're part of an organization that's looking at a lot of businesses that yeah. are trying to 
contribute to the economic prosperity of the sure. state. Yep. Just remind us what, what kinds of projects the Vermont Community yeah. Loan Fund is involved with. Yeah, sure. So the Vermont Community Loan Fund is a revolving loan fund, a community development financial institution. So we're a financial institution like a bank um, in the sense that we lend money like a bank. But where we differ from a bank is that uh, instead of just the financial return or predominantly the financial return, the loan fund is looking for a lot more uh, from the folks that we lend to. Uh, and really, we're looking for community development, economic development in Vermont, and social and economic justice in Vermont. So the things that we care about, of course, getting repaid. But what we really care about, uh, we care about creating quality jobs. We, create, we care about um, creating opportunities for early care and education, child care slots for children and families in Vermont at quality child cares. Um, we finance nonprofits and other community facilities. The loan fund is a nonprofit ourselves. Um, and so we have a lot of experience with the nonprofit and we can finance nonprofits and other community facilities and, um, and uh, affordable housing as well. We started out as a lender for affordable housing in the 80s. Um, and then kind of grew as we saw other needs emerging in the community and, and saw our ability to uh, be able to lend to local businesses with some expertise and to help build their capacity and to be able to lend to childcare, which was, you know, involved a lot of learning on our part to get up to speed on that childcare business model and how we can help them beyond just providing them the capital. Because that's what really is the special sauce of the loan fund is um, the non-financial assistance. It sounds crazy. We're a lender. We make we make loans. But really, I think what helps the folks that we lend to succeed is all of the wraparound services that we provide that help them around business development and program development and things like that, that kind of put them in the best possible position to be able to um, to, to put the money that we can lend them to work. But as far as what we lend for, it's really everything. The Vermont business community, um, you know, I could name f folks that you would recognize, like Mamava or American Flatbread or folks that we were part of their salad days back before they could get conventional lending from a bank, outdoor gear exchange. Um, and then eventually businesses get up to scale, hopefully get up to scale and are able to move beyond us. And that's a great moment as well when they can go get a bank loan. That's a wonderful thing for us. Um, so really, we're lending to Vermont businesses, all shapes and sizes, industries. We have programs directly related to uh, working lands, a couple of different working lands, pots of money, um, outdoor recreation. We have a trails program, which is a new program for working lands uh, or for outdoor recreation businesses. And then most recently, uh, we launched this year the Justice Forward Fund, which is a, a loan fund that's dedicated just to BIPOC Vermonters and, and their business needs and, and business film in that space as well. So pretty diverse. So when you think about meeting um, these organizations, some of them are meeting economic needs, you know, for goods and services, and some of them are actually meeting needs for social requirements, mm -hmm. the, the basic human needs. Yeah. How does how does how do these organizations that deal with a niche subject like food or childcare contribute to the overall economic health of Vermont? Well, I think Vermont's economy is pretty diverse and um, I mean I forget what the statistic is these days but I think it's two out of three business uh, two out of three people working in Vermont work for small businesses um, it, it might be more than that now but in any event small businesses make up business in Vermont there is no large industry beyond the state perhaps the hospital or UVM um, obviously that's pretty regional. Uh, UVM doesn't have a big presence in St. Johnsbury where I grew up or Brattleboro. So our employers are small businesses and it really does, uh, um, you know, a, a healthy small business economy requires all of those small businesses to be strong and to contribute. And um, certainly that's been a big part of the loan funds mission is recognizing that the single proprietors, the small businesses, um, just as important. Uh, in our racial justice work, the most recent work that we've really been focused on, the majority of those businesses are, are much smaller than even our typical businesses. We're talking almost predominantly about sole proprietors. Um, those businesses need, um, those businesses need just as much as any other business and, and and really that's that's what i think it gets down to for us is i mean you ask like i'm sorry can you reframe the question now i'm just yeah no i mean i think you're going there which is how does supporting single organizations companies that uh, meet basic human needs like the child care work that you talk about yeah how does that contribute to 
everyone benefiting? Like how how does the and, and even these small businesses? Yeah. How does supporting sole proprietorships contribute to the overall vitality of the state of Vermont? Well, yeah, I mean, small businesses, I think, make up the economy in Vermont. And so if we're not supporting small businesses, we're not really supporting business in Vermont. And it and businesses, of course, made up of people. And you ultimately have to get back to the people in the household and and make sure those basic needs are met. Um, We have basic human needs, housing, food, um, work, the ability to sustain ourselves and to support our family, support our family unit. Um, and how well do you think Vermont is doing economically? How, I mean, you're in the thick of it. Mm. And there's a lot of complaints about the state and how, you know, there's usually... The state has a lot of problems, right? Like right. We've got a housing crisis. We've got a child care crisis. We have... But where's the good news? Is there any? Um, well, the good news is here. The good news is at VBSR. And it's and it's the people, I mean, you're right, identifying the VBSR, um, the Businesses for Social Responsibility membership. Some of them are organizations actually doing that work in the community. Some of them are businesses selling products. Those, that isn't necessarily doing that work in the community. But one thing that everything, that everyone here cares about is doing that work in the community. The businesses that are here may not day to day produce a thing that furthers that strengthens the community or strengthens economic development in Vermont, um, aside from creating jobs and and livelihoods for people in Vermont. But they're here because they care about and understand that it is the entire state uh, that, as the state functions well, I don't know how to say this in a way that, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling with it. How does VBSR contribute to the well-being of Vermont? I think that VBSR does an incredible job calling out the needs in Vermont and providing both a forum for businesses to gather and learn about them and business people to gather and learn about them. But I think VBSR goes beyond that and takes the extra step um, through various working groups and and really getting folks involved in public policy. Um, I think that VBSR has a vision for a stronger, healthier more sustainable Vermont and and has the ears of the business people doing business in Vermont and really driving business in Vermont. If you look at the businesses that are here, um, they're thinking progressively. They're working at the edges of their business. They're creating things. They're inventing. They're very entrepreneurial. And I think you have to be in Vermont because of all the challenges uh, that are related to doing business in Vermont. Um, VBSR does a great job collecting all of those people, getting all of us together, telling us, sharing with us what the information is, giving us uh, the best possible lay of the land, and then engaging folks to make sure that then you can translate that into practice. Because that's the challenge, right? We're seeing lots of challenges, whether they're in Vermont or in the world, and feeling overwhelmed by all of the challenges and not sure where to go, how to move forward. How, how can I feel like I've done something that I've made some kind of change? And maybe I'm a business person here and my, my business isn't making that change, but I want to use my business, but I want to use my business to make that change. This is the place to come to be able to figure that out and to be able to learn the community, learn the tools that are going to help you move your business, whether that's towards being a B Corp or developing some kind of uh, climate standard for your business and wanting to to understand your climate impact, your carbon impact. Um, there are a number of great, I mean, every session today, any business here could get something out of and figure out a way to bring that back to their business and incorporate it to make their business stronger and more effective, both in their business and in their community. You nailed it, Jake. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jake Eyde, Vermont Community Loan Fund. Thanks for joining us here at the VBSR conference at Dialed Studio. Thank you, Lauren. We're back with Maria McClellan, who is the Senior Outreach and Engagement Officer at UVM Medical Center. Maria, thanks for joining us today. It's so nice to see you, Lauren Glenn. Really, yes. it's just, it's a lot of fun. We don't see each other much, but when we do, you just light up my day. Uh, well, ditto. Right are, back at you. Thanks. How are you yeah. finding the conference to be? I'm amazed at the, you know, the activity outside this door and how many small businesses are out there um, and the space is like amazing and it has a, a, I think, a different energy 
um, than I've ever experienced at one of these conferences before. Um, and we feel privileged to, to sponsor it just because we are the largest employer in the state. So we don't really fit, you know, the exact description of uh, a small business. Um, but we like to be near the small businesses and it's wonderful. So recently the Medical Center came out with a strategic plan. A strategic direction document to talk about and and maybe you have many of them and this may n not ring a bell but um, the point the broader point is that my recollection from reading it is that you don't think about health care in isolation you think of health care as some part of a broader system yeah and I wonder if you could talk about how addressing the health care needs of individuals in our community supports the broader economic prosperity of our state. Yes, well, absolutely it's all intertwined. And um, we, every three years we do a community health needs assessment and we do have a, a document that we publish every three years which um, le leads to a plan for addressing the healthcare needs that are identified in that. Um, and this is a very collaborative process where we surveyed, I mean, we had like 3,700 I think responses to our, our you know quantitative survey and then we also met with like more than 140 people individually or in small groups translated that into like you know more than 12 languages such to be more equitable and get response and and we've been doing this for years and years every three years um, we did it in 2022 and that identified the top three needs no, nothing surprising here um, you know housing um, providing culturally sensitive care um, and also mental health. And these are very broad. And, and, and you can go down beyond those three and you're gonna get to substance use and many other things, childcare, and all of those that are just equally important, really, um, in the overall scheme of things. But we look at this, um, UVM Medical Center, also the whole network, um, that we need to be addressing those needs beyond the four walls where we provide the care. Because if you don't have a roof over your head, if you don't have enough food on the table, um, if you don't have, if, if you can't find childcare for your kids so you can work, you know, it all ties together. It's like dominoes, it's interconnected. Um, so when we, we join with the community in addressing those needs and it really comes down to collaboration. And t talk, I mean, VBSR and sponsoring this conference and being here with others is part of that collaboration, I think. And also talk about other entities that become important to the hospital as you try to address not even just particular problems but the systemic change that needs to happen for the well-being of the state um well there's so many ways that we collaborate and um yes there's like always everything being the you know putting systems in place and all of that is so important um i can you know, I might start with one example, housing, um, which we all know there's a housing crisis and it's been, um, it's more acute now than ever. And we just haven't kept pace with the need in, in, in Vermont, um, Chittenden County, um, and obviously in many other parts of the country. This is um, not just endemic to our area. But what that means in terms of the economics of the state is that it's hard for employers, whether you're big or small, we all know this, there's restaurants on Church Street and then you have the hospital that's using traveling nurses by the dozens and it's very costly because we don't have enough work, uh, enough workforce, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough of a lot of things. Um, and so there's some economics here um, because we pay so much for that temporary work. And, and what really breaks our heart is when we have someone who wants to come work for us, and this happens all the time, but they can't find housing that they can afford, um, or childcare, or, um, but so one of the things we never thought we'd be doing that we're doing, and you've probably read about this, is just that we have started to create our own housing, and we have two um, buildings now in South Burlington in the new city center area, um, one with, I think, 120 units and one with 60 or some odd like that. Um, and the second one that's going to go up is going to have uh, child care in it, like 70, I think, 75 spots. And so this is us kind of saying, like, we need to help address the issue for our own workforce. Um, on top of that, we feel very strongly about helping people in the community who are homeless 
or um, don't have are under housed or um, help them get supportive housing and we work with Champlain Housing Trust and Champ Community Health Centers of Burlington and other organizations to create supports for those folks and we've invested heavily in that whether it's um, Harbor Place on Shelburne Road or Beacon Apartments or other places to provide places for people to live who otherwise if they're on the streets they can't really address their health care needs if you can't take care of your health you're going to be coming in our er all the time right and so that's very costly if we can get people housed it's like a housing first model that champlain housing trust embraces then it's less money um, on the system the entire health care system um, which we all know is too costly, right? So we all we do have to address that. That's just one example. Housing. Um. That's a great example. It's very concrete, and I think it it touches on a lot of the concerns that people have, and it explains why when we make um, when we solve problems closer to people's basic needs, we save money in the whole system overall, and that you know. So when the policy discussions come about where to put the dollars. These examples give some concrete evidence of why those investments are important. And, and prevention, you know, an ounce of prevention, it's the old adage, but if we can get people, um, if we can prevent the terrible, you know, um, outcomes uh, by starting upstream um, and helping people in the primary care setting um, and helping them in the community, because the social determinants that we all talk about these are what affect people's health and well-being. So it's not we have a like we have almost a moral imperative to think about the people who come through our doors before they come through our doors um, and participate in this community, which is so easy to do because there's so many willing um, participants. Another example is opioids, like. You know, at one point when the opioid epidemic reared its head, um, I think the mayor, you know, called us down to City Hall and said, let's talk about how you're going to prescribe less, you know. And we worked with him and um, our president, Steve Leffler, is an ER doctor, was very happy to do that. And our we changed our prescribing met, um, practices and we, you know, helped bring down those opioid overdose deaths, working collaboratively with many other people around a table called Comstat that the mayor kind of stood up. Um, and we credit him for, you know, his willingness to jump in. And so whenever there's a table and someone asks us to sit at it, um, we do. And we, we hope that we're a good community, you know, partner. Maria, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Maria McClellan from the UVM Medical Center, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Lauren Glenn. Have a great day. You too. Okay. So glad to be here with Meg Smith. Meg is the Executive Director of the Vermont Women's Fund. Welcome to the VBSR 33rd Annual Conference here at Dialed Studios. We're so glad to have you here. Hooray. Hooray. Yay for 33. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah it is. It's, it's great it's you're great. here, too, doing this. Thanks, Meg. Um, the, the bigger question is, how does meeting the basic human needs in all areas benefit the economic system as a whole? And I know your focus is on women, but that is just a pretty big basket. So perhaps you could talk about how um, meeting the requirements of um, creating equity for women in our society makes Vermont a better place. Oh, boy. I only have seven minutes. Yes, you okay. do. <laughs> I would put that from... from our perspective, the perspective of the Vermont Women's Fund, we're um, a component fund of the Vermont Community Foundation. We work in the funding space, which takes two forms. One is our grant making. So we raise money to distribute it in grants to women and girls, uh, sorry, nonprofits that support women and girls around the state. Um, but that's not really enough because as time went on, we started almost 30 years ago doing this, it was clear that the social issues, the cultural uh, discrimination, historical discrimination against women was what really needs to be tackled first. So when you talk about meeting women's basic needs, um, what we have focused on in the last several years is, is trying to help women's uh, business owners and entrepreneurs uh, to help them in a rural economy start their own businesses. They've started them, they just need help growing them. So that's been our area of focus and it's um, 
thanks to some fantastic people, we were able to create a digital website and survey and we're counting and identifying women-owned businesses for the first time ever in the state. Nobody knows how many there are because the Secretary of State's office doesn't keep that data, um, never asked for it. So, A, we need to identify our women business owners and B, then find out what they need. And we're kind of in the, we're still identifying them, but we also are learning already after a year what they need. Um, and there, it's a variety of things. I mean, there are tons of solopreneurs, uh, but what is coming to the surface is they need just easy access to low funding, small capital. Um, and that's <clears throat> an area that n banks don't give small loans. Um, it's hard to find grants, even through all the business organizations and technical assistance providers. So it's an interesting landscape, and we're still in progress and in process of learning really what's out there. And just, you know, broadly speaking, what is, just quickly, what is the state of women in Vermont, if you were to characterize? You know, are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? Does it depend on our economic background? What's the... Why does the Vermont Women's Fund even need to exist? <laughs> um, that's such a big question. Um, it needs to exist because women have never had economic power up until recent history. And um, I mean, there are always a few single examples, but I mean, it took to 1973 before women could get a credit card on their own and not have it to have it co-signed. There's a long history of discrimination against women trying to get um, loans, collateral, all the things banks want that women don't have and they don't fit into that box. So economic power is a really critical underpinning of all of this. Um, so, sorry, tell me what you asked me again. No, that... <laughs> That's, I think you answered the okay, question. Okay, good. <laughs> I think you did. That's so great. So thanks a million. Yeah. So glad you're here. Thank Always you. Always glad to see your like, sunshine. Oh, I can't wait to hear the yeah. compilation of yeah. everything they've put There's together. There's some good interviews, yeah. Grace Odell, welcome to VBSR's 33rd conference, 33rd annual conference here at Dialed Studios. And we're doing a series of interviews. We're so glad you could join us. You're the executive director at NOFA Vermont. Yep. Congratulations, Thank such you. a storied organization. I've heard a lot about you, so I feel honored to meet you. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. So do you focus at NOFA Vermont on food security? Is that safe to say, or is it sort of a broader mission that you have? We have a broader mission. So we are really interested in using food and farming as this lever where social and environmental justice meet. So we think if we can get food and farming right, how we take care of this place and how we feed each other, we really just solve so many more intersectional issues facing our community. So we work in a variety of ways. We have folks working all over the state from a lot of angles on making change in agriculture. And so on this question that we've been asked to discuss, how does meeting the basic needs of individuals benefit the entire economic system? How would you respond? I think that I would step back and, and look at the word economy, which is built of two parts. There's oikos and nomos put together to make economy. And with oikos, you have the household. And nomos is about management. So how, how are we managing our home? And economy is how are we doing that together? And when I think about an economic system that actually is managing our shared home in a way that is caring and enduring, that's pretty far from what I see in our economic system today. And um, I think that what we need to do now is everything we can to build bridges from the economic system and the, yeah, the economic system of today to the one that will really be durable and thriving and resilient. So a lot of the programs we, we build and run and a lot of the people we help network and support in what they're doing is really about imagining those bridges to an economic system that's really about valuing our place, valuing er the earth and our relationship to a planet, and also valuing everyone in the community and ensuring that everyone has access to, to good food that's grown here and that we're all safer when we're really managing our shared home 
together in a in a really healthy way. And are you hopeful about building that bridge from today to the kind of economy we want? I don't think we have a choice but to be hopeful. And I I feel hopeful because I know on the people side there are so many good people thinking and working and organizing for a just transition to an economy that really values care over profit, care of earth and of people over just a bottom line. And I'm also hopeful because I know how the earth works. And uh, as someone who has farmed for years, I know that if you take, if you do one small act of care, the earth will respond tenfold to meet what you're doing and there's there's so much abundant regenerative possibility in in the earth and in remembering our place as part of nature and those combined people are trying and the earth is willing to meet us when we try does make me feel hopeful well grace odell that's a, just a profound ending to a series of interviews here at the 33rd annual vbsr conference Thanks for joining us at Dialed Studios, and thanks for all the work that you do. Thanks for having me. It's an honor.